So, as we discussed in some of our previous videos, such as, for instance, the one on uh, what if England had remained Catholic, yeah? What we have to understand is that the English uh, national sense of identity has kind of been moulded over the last 500 years as being separate from the continent. Because, obviously, we're an island nation, we've kind of governed ourselves very differently from how the continent has governed itself. And so, for many in England, the idea of England is as separate from the continent. We often talk about going to Europe, yeah, like when we're going on holiday, even though people, you know, from a geographical standpoint, you'd be like, you're in Europe. But it kind of illustrates just that the separation in people's minds between Britain and Europe. And so obviously within the space of those four or five hundred years, England went out and formed its own empire and traded with countries all around the world and always had a very global kind of uh, mindset. However, most countries on the continent had a very uh, continental, inward-looking viewpoint of the world. And so this is where you kind of see this clash of kind of two visions in a way. And with the collapse of that empire, you started to see a need for people to kind of replace what had been before. You know, if there was no empire, what was our source of power? Like, what was our source of trade, of commerce, etc., etc.? And so people like Winston Churchill, many other people, primarily within the Conservative Party, wanted Britain to be linked more and more with the continent. And Winston Churchill himself proposed the idea of the United States of Europe. However, obviously, a lot of people kind of failed to realise is that Winston Churchill went on to say that Britain should not be part of this United States of Europe, that the countries on the continent should be part of it, but that we should, you know, because of our links to the rest of the world and the open ocean, we should be more focused on that. However, a lot of people in the Conservative Party wanted Britain to join what at that point was the European Coal and Steel Community, which later became the European Economic Community, and obviously many years later became the European Union that we all know about. So the European Economic Community was founded in 1957, and Britain didn't join until 1973, and after a lot of kicking and screaming and like pleading to the French, like we eventually were allowed in. However, a lot of people within Britain were very hostile to uh, joining. And after many years of campaigning, finally in 1975, there was a referendum held. And in that referendum, the yes side said it was just a trading area, right? It was just a free trade area. There was no politics, there was no parliament. At that point, there was no European parliament. There was no inklings of there being a common currency or any kind of thing. It was just trade, people were told. It's just trade. And so many of the people on uh, the other side, such as Tony Benn, Enoch Powell, etc., etc., they were kind of seen as alarmist, right? And they were kind of seen as, you know, people who were basically being doom mongers, saying like, if we joined, it would be the end of British national sovereignty. It would be, uh, as a Hugh Gates school a few years before had said, it would be the end of a thousand years of uh, English history. You know, so a lot of these people were seen as alarmists at the time. However, these people looked through the Treaty of Rome, which was the founding document of the EU, and could see within it this line of an ever closer union. Basically, the EU wanting to head more and more towards creating this United States of Europe. And as the years went on, as the decades went on, more and more people within Britain could start to see that actually, whether they agreed with them or not, that side tended to be right. So in 1979, just four years after this referendum, where people said it's just trade, it's just trade, there's no politics, four years later, they end up being a European Parliament. Skip forward a few years, you end up having the single market being created, admittedly largely to do with the insistence of uh, Margaret Thatcher herself because she wanted to liberalise the uh, economies of Europe. Then, in 1993, the year of my birth, you had the Maastricht Treaty. And this Maastricht Treaty, combined with uh, Britain having to join up to the ERM, basically confirmed for many people that Europe was now heading towards a political entity, that it was heading more and more towards the United States of Europe. And many people in the Conservative Party had now switched the Conservative Party, which had been the Party of Europe, and the Labour Party, which had been the party opposed to membership. They now, in the late 80s and early 90s, switched positions. And now the Eurosceptic Party was more and more becoming the party of the Conservatives. So although many people in the Conservative Party, such as the Maastricht Rebels and the Bruges Group, although they were opposed to uh, the, the Maastricht Treaty, eventually they were whipped into line and they ended up voting for it. And this led to one person in particular splitting away from the Conservative Party and helping to form a party known as UKIP, the UK Independence Party. And this person was none other than Nigel Farage. And he became leader in 1993. And for the next 23 years, he campaigned non-stop for Britain to leave the EU or to at least have a referendum on our membership of the EU. So fast forward to 2016. 
So you'd already had uh, European elections in 2014 and you'd had the general election in 2015. And the Conservative Party, because of pressure from UKIP, understood that now they needed to have a referendum. And so the idea from David Cameron was that if we had a referendum on the European membership, that the Remain side would end up winning and then this would kind of diffuse the Eurosceptic argument. We said, well, look, we had a vote, you guys lost, time to be quiet now, let's just get on with it. However, they misunderstood and underestimated the size of support for the Brexit vote. And so in 2016, although all the polls were saying, although all the experts were saying that it was going to be a, a Remain victory, what ended up happening is that Leave ended up winning. And in disgrace, David Cameron ended up resigning as Conservative Party leader and as Prime Minister of the UK. So within this alternative scenario, what we're going to imagine is one person doesn't switch sides and go for the Brexit side, right? And that person is none other than Boris Johnson. Now, I don't want to make this all about like one man. You know, oftentimes in history, too much is put on the shoulders of one man. However, we can see in this case from Poland evidence that the influence that Boris Johnson had on the referendum seems to have been decisive because Boris Johnson was well liked within the Conservative Party at that time, both by Leavers and Remainers. And it was a thing where him coming out and supporting Leave made a lot of people who otherwise were a bit on the fence and a bit like, mm, I don't really know, it seems a bit extreme, seems a bit like kind of, yeah, like, Basically, he gave legitimacy to the Brexiteer argument. And so a lot of people in the Conservative Party in particular end up switching sides and end up voting for Brexit. And this is mainly how it ended up happening. So what we can imagine in this timeline is that Boris Johnson sticks with the Remain side and as a result, Remain ends up winning. So what would have happened is basically that uh, David Cameron would have stayed on as Prime Minister probably until, let's say, maybe 2020, at which point he would have stood down. Now, he wanted his right-hand man, George Osborne, uh, who was the then-Chancellor, to take over. However, we can see from opinion polls at the time that even then, Boris Johnson was the most popular person to take over after Dave Cameron. And so, what we could probably imagine is maybe in 2020, if all else being equal would have happened, uh, that Boris Johnson would probably have become the Prime Minister anyway. And while Boris Johnson was critical of the EU in many regards, he wouldn't have actively tried to take uh, Britain out of the EU. However, as we can see with the Scottish referendum of 2014, David Cameron once again thought that he could hold a referendum and that this would uh, placate the side that had lost. However, what ended up happening as a result of the 2014 referendum is that although the SNP lost, what ended up happening is that in 2015, they ended up getting a boost. And so we can imagine something very similar happening with the Brexit side. Now, at the time you had UKIP, which David Cameron referred to as being a bunch of uh, closet racists and fruitcakes. And UKIP kind of had an image of pretty much like kind of like right-wing populist uh, kind of uh, politics, yeah, which many people were very turned off by. However, a few years later, Nigel Farage split away from UKIP to try and distance himself from like the other people within his party. And he set up the Brexit Party. Now, the Brexit Party was a kind of like a uh, catch-all party uh, which uh, encouraged people from across the political divide. If you supported Brexit, come together, let's get this thing done. And the pressure that the Brexit Party put on the Conservative Party in the summer of 2019, as we discussed in our previous video, what if Britain had a proportional representation, definitely check that out. Uh, what we can see is that pretty much the Conservative Party was on its knees. And that more likely than not, if the Brexit side had lost in 2016, you would have had the rise of the Brexit Party in 2019, etc, etc. And so while they would have lost the referendum, more likely than not, you would have had a large party which potentially could have got a majority of seats because obviously remember that within the uh, British parliamentary system uh, you don't need to have a majority of voters you just need to have a plurality of them. Let's say the vote was uh, split instead of 52% for uh, leave let's say it's 52% for remain. 48% of people voting for leave even if like not all of them vote but let's just say a majority of those do then that still is a sizable chunk, right? If say 40% of people, 45% of people decide to come together and vote for this new party, then as we can see like from uh, the 2019 uh, European elections, and if it was scaled onto the level of parliamentary constituencies, we can see that the Brexit party would have easily won a majority of uh, parliamentary seats. And so with that kind of mandate, then they would have been able to have pushed for a second referendum on the EU. 
because Nigel Farage said that even if the Leave side had lost, that he would have carried on fighting, he would have carried on pushing for a uh, next referendum to be able to challenge this. So within the right wing of British politics, you would have had a whole lot of division and toxicity within uh, those uh, set of years. However, within the left wing of British politics, you would have had a certain level of unity or more unity than was otherwise the case. And this is partly because the Remain side end up obviously losing their own timeline. And part of why they lost was blamed at the then Labour leader, Jeremy Corbyn. So Jeremy Corbyn was like a full on like leftist and uh, he for many years had always been a solid Eurosceptic. But upon becoming Labour leader in the run up to the 2016 uh, referendum, all of a sudden he suddenly abandoned the values he'd held for all his life and basically said, 